to the research and policy seminar, The Global Economy at Turning Point. This event has simultaneous interpretation available in English and Spanish. Please use the world icon at the bottom of the Zoom menu and choose the language of your preference. Para los que se unen en este momento, el evento cuenta con interpretación en inglés y español. En el icono del mundo, en la parte inferior de su pantalla, podrá seleccionar el idioma de su preferencia. We have the IDB president, Mr. Elan Goldfein, with the welcoming remarks. Mr. Goldfein, the microphone is yours. It's a pleasure to be here for several reasons. Uh, first, uh, to address this group. Uh, I have been part of this group for in several capacities. Uh, Central Bank, also as a, a speaker, and now I'm so glad to be here as the president of the IDB and have this uh, 57th uh, meeting, and we are not counting, 57 meeting of the network of central banks and finance ministers of Latin America. So thank you all to be here in person and the ones that are with us not, not here. You just had a session uh, on the global economic outlook discussing uh, the very uh, important and challenging moment and uh, nothing better than having a topic on the global economy at a turning point. Uh, but I told you that I am glad and happy to be here for several reasons. So the other reason is that we are here having um, a dear friend and uh, uh, a very respected and leading economist, Ken Rogoff. I don't know if you know, I mean, you know Ken Rogoff, of course, but I don't know if you know that he has been uh, several times in Latin America. He's a very good friend uh, and has come frequently, I don't know if lately, but uh, along several years, so he knows the region. He has been thinking about that, and uh, uh, he doesn't need further introduction, but as we always do. He is the prof Professor Rogov is Maritz Boas Chair of International Economics at Harvard University. He served as Chief Economist at the IMF from 2001 to 2003. He has done groundbreaking research on a lot of topics you have been seeing, Central Bank Independence, International Financial Crisis, Exchange Rate, kind of account, imbalances, political budget cycles. Uh, you certainly have seen his several books. I mean, this time it's different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly, The Curse of Cash. You may have been graduated with his book with Morris on the Foundation of International Macroeconomics. And we can go on and on. Uh, just to tell you that we are very honored to have Ken with us, he's a member of the National Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Science, and the Group of 30. He's the top 10 ranking of economists by scholarly citations. So he will present his view on the challenges facing the global economy today and the implications. Ken, this is a group that uh, is in the frontier of research with policy making. So I think we are exactly uh, in the place where uh, your wisdom is, can have actually an important influence in the region. Uh, we have now, as a turning point, I will say, uh, as you all know, Latin America is facing higher interest rates, higher cost of capital, and uh, this comes always with uh, challenges, of course. Those rates are there for inflation, and inflation is another, another challenges that we are facing in the region, but certainly not only there. Uh, 
We are also facing a global war, a global world of polarization. So that's also something that the region has to has to address. So I would like, uh, on behalf of all of us here, uh, to thank uh, you all to be here and also can uh, to spend his time and uh, give us his wisdom. Uh, we'll have Ken do the, his presentation, and then we'll have our chief economist, Eric, moderating the question and answer uh, session. I will have to, uh, unfortunately, I'll have to excuse myself, but I'm sure you all uh, will be in very good company. So, Ken, please. Uh, thank you very much to uh, uh, President Goldfan, my old friend, uh, for that kind introduction. Th uh, thanks to everyone for being here in what is a very busy period for all of you. Uh, and uh, I'm honored to have you make time for this. And also to those of you that are here uh, uh, attending this uh, uh, virtually. So. Um, the first thing I want to say, really, before I launch into my topic, is that it, it is, I think, especially important to speak here at the Inter-American Development Bank during a period when, if you go over to the IMF and World Bank meetings, and I don't want to, maybe this isn't completely fair caricature, but there's a lot of focus on the richest countries a lot of focus on the poorest countries, which are certainly having you know, a very difficult time in debt distress. But there's a sense in which the middle-income countries are somewhat abandoned during this period. And I wouldn't just say for uh, bailout funds, but just generally studying the problems, what's going on. Uh, and the research group here in the Inter American Development Bank, you know, pl really filling in, I think, an important uh, gap. The, the, the World Bank, of course, is very focused on, on, on the poorest countries. And again, maybe that's not a fair caricature. There's excellent material on Latin America and the latest World Economic Outlook and Global Financial Stability Report, but it's, but it's not, I think you can all agree, it's not, it's not really the focus. Um, a second thing I should say is that this is uh, an exceptionally difficult time to think about what's next. I don't, you can always say that, but I, th I think it's exceptionally so at the moment, just emerging from the pandemic, what's going on with the global geopolitical system. Uh, th these are major things that have hit, and the financial crisis was not that long ago. So what is normal uh, afterwards? And um, the, um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, there's certainly people who say there are many things are just gonna kind of go back to the way they were, but that, that certainly a possibility, but there's a, a lot of uh, variance uh, around that. I, I uh, wanna stress, uh, I don't know what to say here. <laughs> oh, that worked. But it's not advancing. Uh, let me try this. There we go. Oops. Is it? OK. Um, I, want, I want to just list a few things that I want to emphasize today. Uh, but uh, I. Uh, I want to emphasize a few things uh, today that I want to focus on, but I could have picked other things to focus on. They've probably been of special interest to me in my research. I think they're really important, but I could have picked other things. Okay, so one thing is if you read the World Bank a week ago, uh, look at the IMF report, they're rather dramatically downgrading long-term global growth. Like, so certainly there's the, been this view that we're in a malaise and uh, growth is slowing down. That's been around for a long time. But it's, it, it, I would say it's definitely uh, sharply it, it, uh, emphasized more 
in these reports. And I, I think, you know, they point at reasons like financial problems, the pandemic. I'm not, I'm not sure how convincing anything of it is. I don't know if we know, but uh, that's certainly there. I uh, think, I think that maybe uh, doesn't get emphasized enough that is, a, <clears throat> I think, at a turning point, is we may have come to the end of hypergrowth in China. That there are a whole number of reasons why the next decade could really be quite a bit slower than the decade before. There had been some slowdown. Uh, depends on what statistics you look at, uh, how much the slowdown has been, but there's certainly been some slowdown leading up to this. But I want to try to talk about why I think it might be much more dramatic going forward. Uh, I've been writing, uh, doing research on this for a while. I'll uh, talk about a little bit of that. I, I think the point I'm going to emphasize the most, it is far from the only point, is that if you look at China's go-to growth strategy, it's really been uh, real estate and infrastructure uh, and building things. And there, are, um, w those of you, and I think many of you who've been to China, uh, you know, are in awe of what they've done. But I try to sh show you some statistics and research to suggest maybe they're reaching dim significantly diminishing returns to scale uh, on this in the same way that Japan eventually ran out of infrastructure, its bridges to nowhere. You could go back to the old Soviet Union with the cement and steel and railways that seemed to be working really well. I'm actually in my version of Samuelson that was the undergraduate textbook that I used when I was an undergraduate. He emphasized that, in his opinion, the USSR would catch up to the United States. This was in the early 70s when I had that, and that seems, well, laughable now, but that was a very, uh, very common point of view. And you, we can go through this cycle with other countries, Japan be, uh, being an example, and I think most recently China, where a lot of the growth is coming from building stuff, similar stuff, and you run into diminishing returns. I think there are other reasons uh, that are, I'm not going to emphasize as much in my talk, but they're important. Uh, one is demographics, where certainly starting by 2030, if not sooner, the labor force in China is going to be really falling quite rapidly, and in fact, you can look at the UN uh, forecasts of what China's population will be at the end of the 21st century. And the numbers, right now it's 1.4 billion, and the numbers range from maybe 1.1 billion at the high end to 750 million at the low end. It's really quite, en like, los dos extremos. quite, a, quite, dramatic, a, quite a dramatic change. Um, and uh, another thing I would point to and I don't know that I have any special knowledge of this, but it's a sense of mine of what's going on. And I've been saying this for a long time, including when I uh, spoke to the China Development Congress back in, uh, at the uh, plenary session back in 2016, the increased emphasis on centralized decision making, uh, to my Western economics point of view, probably is not a great thing for dynamic growth over the long run. And again, with all due respect to the incredible achievements of China, I felt there's been a move away from the model uh, that they had. Uh, and then I, I'm going to come to uh, come to talking about uh, deglobalization. Um, I don't know what's going on there. So actually in the trade numbers, there's not necessarily such glaring evidence of deglobalization, but nevertheless, the tensions, the geopolitical tensions, the tensions between uh, China and the United States are acute. And it, uh, if I can, you know, say a little bit more about that, uh, I, th I think the, the shoe that has not dropped <clears throat> in the Russia-Ukraine war in terms of the global economy is that there are sanctions on Russia, but they're really designed so that it can export 
everything that it was exporting before. The United States is importing a lot of uranium from Russia still. And uh, in general, uh, Russia suffers some greater transactions costs, in some cases some lower prices. But most of what it exported, it's still able to export because the sanctions are not getting in the way. The sanctions are different than were put on Iran, North Korea, or if you go back to South Africa in the 1980s, where in all of these cases there were what we call secondary sanctions, where we're not going to, you know, Europe says we're not going to buy oil, but if, and if you buy the oil, we'll put sanctions on you. Well, we haven't come close to doing that. There are a lot of reasons for that. But I think there are certain scenarios of uh, escalation where that's a profound risk that's hanging out there. Uh, and of course, there are other things in the competition. I, I mentioned demographics uh, in the slides here because, in fact, China has been a huge engine of global growth. And as it slows down who will replace them, I will say it is an opportunity uh, for sure. As, as China ages, that uh, a younger uh, Latin America could possibly uh, take advantage of, or India, or Africa. And I think it's a, a, an open question how long it will take uh, for that to take place. Another uh, point I, I want to talk about, and this is, I, I admit, more, uh, more speculative, but um, again, something I've been both saying for a long time and have done uh, uh, research on in the last few years is that we have to accept the possibility not only that interest rates are temporarily elevated, but when inflation comes down, interest rates will not necessarily come down to what you're used to. Another way of putting it is that after the financial crisis, inflation came down, but interest rates came down a lot more depending on how you measure it, and there are a lot of ways to measure it. But looking at longer term interest rates, we're talking about changes on the order of 200 basis points, 2% or more, that interest rates fell. And uh, I think there are a number of reasons to think that that might not all be permanent. And I, I, that's a very debated point. But one thing I will show you is if you just look at a longer view on the history of uh, interest rates, as I've done with uh, Barbara Rossi and Paul, Sch Paul Schmelzing, uh, there's a lot of volatility, but a lot of it is transitory. That doesn't ha it has a half-life of, call it, two to five years, but it's not 100 years. They're definitely something that fades over time. So I think there's a question of what happens after the financial crisis. I'll, I'll talk at the fundamentals uh, later. If all of this happens, then I do think it's going to put more pressures on central banks to maintain low inflation. I'm not talking about inflation staying up in double digits as it is in many Latin American countries or Europe, the United States, uh, United Kingdom, all hit double digit inflation. I'm not talking about that. But I do think uh, we could run into a period where the normal rate of inflation, not the target rate of inflation, but the normal rate of inflation is a percent, even 2 percent higher than central banks are promising and saying that they would like it to be. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's a nice book by uh, Charles Goodhart and Pradhan, uh, which it doesn't have a model, but talks about how demographic change in Eastern Europe and China and aging in the advanced economies could lead to a lot less supply and a lot more demand. The, the aging they're talking about is the very old uh, that will require much more care and cost in advanced economies and the fall in these countries that have really been the big engine of globalization. I, uh, but, but I think there are a number of other factors, as I talk about above, that will make things difficult. Uh, I actually wrote a paper about this 20 years ago now that I presented at Jackson Hole, the big central bankers conference, and it had the title, um, 
globalization and disinflation. And I presented a model and some, also some dem demographics and analysis uh, suggesting maybe you've done a great job keeping inflation down, but maybe the wind's been at your backs pointing to central banks. Maybe going forward it won't be so easy. And I would say the flip side now, to the extent that real interest rates get higher, that there's deglobalization, less coming out of China, and to the extent other regions don't replace it, the pressures are, are, uh, are going to be very different. Um, lastly, um, uh, uh, clearly we're in an era where the risk of financial crisis has gone up. And when uh, interest rates rise this much, this fast, it's really not surprising to have accidents. It's, I wrote about, at the beginning of January, I wrote an article uh, called The Looming Financial Contagion about, you know, why this was something that was common to many regions of the world. It's not just about banks. It's certainly not just about U.S. banks or Swiss banks. It's something much broader uh, than that. When interest rates rise very quickly, people are caught off guard. And also, if I'm right about real interest rates rising, that's even more fundamental if that stays. That's not something that's necessarily uh, going to unwind. And if you study the history of uh, financial crises, they play out over a long period. It isn't you have a bad month and things are okay and things are better again. Those of you uh, that remember following the European debt crisis and financial crisis, it, it played out over a two-year period where you know, it was Greece, and then it was, uh, that would be only Greece. Oh, but then there was Ireland and Portugal. Well, it was only Ireland and Portugal, and it would be over. Oh, and then there was Spain, and then there was Italy, and it went on. It was a very long period. And even if you looked at the, Phoenician, the uh, Asian crisis, 1997-98, or the crises that were echoes of that that happened in Latin America with uh, Argentina, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, Uruguay, other countries uh, that, that had problems. They don't happen on top of each other. Uh, th these are things that uh, uh, take a while uh, to un unfold. So um, I, wanna, I wanna just expand uh, on a few of these things. So uh, these are the World Bank estimates of potential growth. I don't really need to dwell on this. They're mar everyone's marking them down, the IMF, uh, followed suit in its analysis that it released yesterday. So I wanted to talk a little bit about China real estate. And I, I listed a bunch of issues in China, but this is one I think that's misunderstood the significance of it. Uh, when people analyze real estate in China, they talk about, well, the Chinese government's tightening because they're worried about the financial risks. They can always loosen up, and then there won't be a problem. The, uh, there, there are various ways to measure the size of the real estate sector. This is uh, from a paper of mine with Yuan Chen Yang, who's at the IMF, but not responsible for my remarks today. Um, they are solely mine. Um, but the paper is our joint paper, uh, where we measure the direct and indirect footprint of real estate in China. If you don't include uh, imported inputs, it's on the order of 23%. If you do, it's 26%. And if you measure uh, other countries during their real estate booms, uh, this is looking at uh, both housing and commercial real estate. If you look at other countries, it's very high, even compared to Spain and Ireland at, at, their, at their peaks. And um, I think what's sort of not, as I said, not so understood, is they have built a lot. This is actually from an earlier paper with Yuan Chen uh, called Peak China Housing, where we look at the, uh, do, uh, using very disaggregated data, use measures of how much real estate China's built. And yeah, I understand there are all sorts of issues about uh, uh, 
you know, the uh, duration, uh, how, how long they're built for and such, and we talk about them in the paper. But I fundamentally don't think it changes this, which is China has comparable uh, real estate per capita as very rich countries, even though even if you use the Penn World Tables uh, measure of per capita GDP, which flatters uh, China's GDP, uh, it's like a quarter of these rich countries. So that's the, and you could, in, in our uh, further work, we look at uh, infrastructure and other measures, and you see this across the board. Now, when we wrote our first paper on this, the reaction we got from many people was, well, uh, fine, but uh, if you look around Shenzhen and Guangzhou and Shanghai and Beijing, which is pretty much where all the Westerners hang out, doesn't seem so bad. They built a lot. Yeah, there's a little bit of pockets of problems. But the, uh, so um, we wrote a, a, a further paper called A Tale of uh, Tier uh, 3. Tier, three. Tier. Um, I have no control over that, sorry. A Tale of Tier 3, but it, but it emphasized an important point that I wanted to make. Uh, a Tale of Tier 3 Cities where um, if you look at these smaller and poorer cities, which, which are not small by Western standards, but they, uh, you're not including the four cities I named and another 30 to 35 uh, provincial capitals, administrative uh, cities like um, uh, 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 um, various, uh, Sorry, I'm blanking out on name, but various administrative cities. And you look at this, these smaller, smaller ones and poorer ones. They account for 60% of China's GDP, and 50% of the value of China's housing stock by market value, at least according to the measures we put together. Sure, and if you sure, sure, look sure. at the uh, physical amount, uh, we're talking about 80% uh, of the physical. And if you want to look at roads or bridges and things like that. It's much larger. And I have to say, when China was doing this, I was aware of it, and I wasn't particularly criticizing it, because everybody's uh, having trouble with this, uh, this problem of how do you deal with the increasing concentration into cities, which causes a lot of problems in Latin America and Asia. How do you spread, how do you persuade people uh, to spread out more. There's something called Ziff's Law, which we economists study a lot in all sorts of contexts about this tremendous concentration due to network effects in, uh, in uh, the largest companies, the largest cities, the largest uh, platforms. And China resisted this. And that part of their whole hukou system to try to prevent everybody from going to the big cities was to do this. But um, the problem is the good jobs never came. I'm exaggerating. There's a lot of cities. It's not true of all. But by and large, if you look across the tier three cities, it hasn't worked. And uh, in fact, um, you've, um, uh, uh, you've seen that uh, uh, there's actually been housing price drops there have been slight drops in many cities, but very sharp drops in the tier three cities uh, post-COVID and people leaving. And I don't know what it'll end up being at, but I do think there's, uh, there's something more fundamental uh, going on here. So I want to back up to this point that if you read, at least until recently, I think some of places have gotten this better recently. But Many of the commentators said, well, they're not going to have a financial crisis. There's no danger because everything's state controlled. So there's no real estate problem in China. There is in the same sense that Japan had or the Soviet Union had or many Asian countries, which is that there's diminishing returns. You have to do something else. OK, they can do green energy. So there's talk about that. They're going to do a lot of green energy. but that's. When you're talking about something that was accounting for 25 or 26 percent of GDP, 23 uh, percent if you don't include imported inputs, that, that's not a very easy transition uh, to make. I think it's something that's very difficult. And 
it's not going to be very easy financially if you look at uh, uh, going on into uh, a lot of smaller cities and, and uh, com commercial banks. Well, I'll skip uh, talking about de uh, deglobalization further, but I want to um, Uh, I'm trying to advance the slide. It happened. Um, no, it didn't. Sorry. Uh, I'm trying unsuccessfully to advance the slide. I'm used to this at Harvard, so you know, don't know uh, nothing special here. Um, if you look at, uh, if you look at, uh, we want one too many here. Um, if you, this is just one measure of real long-term interest rates. This is the 10-year uh, U.S. Treasury Inflation Index interest rate. And the secular stagnation period, Larry Summers gave a speech in 2013, and you go through the end of 2021, the average real interest rate on 10-year bonds measured this way was about zero. And that was like that across many other things. It hadn't been before. But it was very low. Uh, I, I think there are lots of reasons for that. I w don't have time to talk about it. I think a lot of things people said, productivity, demographics, inequality, were true, but exaggerated. They were ex post uh, rationalizations. I'm trying to advance the slide again. I have a feeling I'm not actually controlling this. Um, uh, OK. I, I'll tell you what's on the slide. Maybe it'll get there. So in uh, my work with Barbara Rossi and Paul Schmelzing, we look at much longer horizons. Actually, Paul Schmelzing did this path-breaking work looking, creating a 700-year real interest rate, uh, inflation and interest rate series, which we use to form uh, real interest rates. And there's, there's been a steady trend decline, but it's you know, maybe one and a half basis points, that's a hundredth of a percent, a basis point per year. It's not something which changes by 200 basis points in a short period. And in fact, there's a lot of volatility around it and pretty good reason to think that there might be a uh, reversion to mean. And in that work, we explore uh, other reasons that that might have happened. Uh, was it demographics that, uh, for example, there was a long-term downward trend? No, that doesn't work at all. That's a very recent correlation. It's somebody finding an ex post correlation that supports something that happened if you look at a short period. And I actually think Goodhart and Perdon's book pushes back on this very, very well, because what seemed like something that was creating a lot of saving may eventually lead to a situation where it's creating a lot of dissaving as the people who are retiring, I'm in the baby boom generation in the United States, as we actually retire, we're not earning and we're spending money and we're getting older and older and needing more and more uh, care. Uh, another thing people look at is productivity. Every say, oh, interest rates fell, you know, 2%, even 3% because productivity dropped. And that's just nonsense. I mean, productivity started falling in the 1970s. If you look at Robert Gordon's book, that's not a new, uh, that's not a new phenomenon. I, I think inequality is a little bit more difficult to look at. So anyway, I, I would contend that, uh, oh, we, we finally arrived at the slide. So uh, you can see the tremendous volatility. So yes, there's downward trend, and it depends on how you try to extract the trend. There is a downward trend. This is over a very long period, so it seems like it's a very big trend. But when you're looking at 700 years, it's not so big. But it's very volatile, and things seem to die out. And you need to be careful of uh, thinking of what's volatility. Now, I, I did just get uh, yesterday evening the IMF's view of all this. They're saying interest rates will go back to what they were before the pandemic, real interest rates. I, I don't think anyone knows, but I'm just registering that they did say that, and they give the usual reasons. But uh, I, I think that's uh, that's something to uh, uh, we need to uh, 
bear in mind over the longer term. Let me, let me explore a couple reasons. Uh, oh, I, I forgot I had this slide. The IMF's a lot less optimistic for you. Um, so that's advanced countries. These are ex post real interest rates, which are not really a forward looking measure of real interest rates. The, the right measure is what do you expect inflation to be, but it has not come down nearly as much in emerging markets and developing economies. And uh, of course, correspondingly, inflation uh, uh, has not come down as much. So I want to point at, uh, talk about some of the reasons I think real interest rates would be higher going forward. So one is there's a lot of debt. Debt has exploded. That's a subject here. It's a subject of uh, the IMF World Economic Outlook, many other things. And yes, when global debt goes up by 1%, it's hard to know what the effect is on real interest rates. But it has gone up a lot more than 1%. I'll show you a, a slide for the U.S. in a moment. And just virtually any model, the simplest, I may not mean anything to any of you, but overlapping generations model, uh, such as Olivier Blanchard uses, gives you quite an interest rate effect when you have that big a rise in debt. So that's one thing. But I also say, coming back to my theme about a turning point in the world economy, I don't know what's going to happen to geopolitics, but I do know defense expending is going to go way up across much of the world. It's, and I'm not telling you the year it's going up or what the Democrats say or the Republicans say in the U.S. or what Europe says, but if you look at the problems that the United States and Europe are facing, fighting, uh, supplying uh, Ukraine, which they're way overstretching their capacity, and that doesn't count potential in the Middle East, potential in, uh, in Asia. All over the world, there's going to be easily a 1% increase in the major countries in defense spending over the next 10 years. In, in fact, this is the United States defense spending as a share of GDP. And I will say, you know, there, there are some technical issues of comparing across time of how they account for health care of veterans and things like that. But I think the spirit of this, uh, which comes from the official statistics, is pretty accurate. So uh, it goes all the way back to World War II when defense spending was very high as a share of GDP. But even if you go to the fall of the Berlin Wall back at the end of the 1980s, it was way higher as a percent of GDP. It's market at 6.8%. Now it's 3.6%. And uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of social priorities and they're really important, but I, I predict it's going to go up. And the same thing in Europe. Uh, I, I, they, they, you know, I don't know when that's going to happen, but I, I, I think in, the, in any scenario it's going to go up. Obviously it's going up in China. It's going up. Japan has pledged to have it go up. Uh, it's the you know, third largest economy. Uh, in Germany, uh, it's, it's being pledged to go up. That, that's a big change. And I, I mentioned uh, debt uh, going up. Uh, this is a projection of the uh, Congressional Budget Office, a very recent one of what debt to GDP ratios. This is just government debt. When I'm talking about debt, I'm talking about global debt, counting everything. It's rising very sharply. And uh, actually, around 2030, early 2030s, the U.S. hits a demographic cliff where the taxes just aren't enough to support the social programs. Many other countries are facing this. Y you can look at McKinsey's had a report, many others, of global debt just exploding. Um, w lastly, um, some people say, well, Debt's kind of irrelevant because the interest rate's less than the growth rate. You may have heard that. And I would only say that that's actually always been true. That's not something new. This is from a paper by uh, Maro and Zhao from a, a few years ago. That's an IMF, uh, uh, IMF paper. Um, and 
uh, been published since then showing that in, in emerging markets that's uh, typically true. It's been true in the United States and advanced countries most of the time, and it does not prevent having uh, uh, crises. So uh, let, me, let me conclude uh, my comments uh, just saying that I do think we're at a turning point. I um, suspect, uh, particularly if some of these problems I've highlighted are you know, really come to pass, they're certainly going to lead to slower growth, higher real interest rates, higher inflation. I don't know if we'll have more uh, financial crises, but it, it's something that seems very hard uh, to avoid uh, at this point in time, given uh, all these adverse uh, scenarios. So anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rogo, for this in incredible and, and very insightful uh, presentation, uh, despite the glitches. So <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, now I'm planning to moderate a Q&A session for a couple of minutes. So if you want to make uh, a question, please uh, raise your hand and say your name and your affiliation, and you can make the, the question. Um, probably, probably we're going to start here. Hi. Okay. <clears throat> Gerardo Ligandro, Central Bank of Uruguay. Um, you were discussing this with this last slide. If you put that slide together with your as a idea of a interest rate r raising on the level of debt, then uh, that usually would lead to an unsustainable debt problem. And uh, therefore, it, uh, if that were Uruguay, it would certainly, you would have this map with two steady states, one with the local sustainable debt and then other with global and sustainable debt. And uh, uh, that would mean that the, these efforts in war and, and, and defense spending are not sustainable. Uh, so so you, you are sort of saying, uh, telling us a story that in the medium term there's a, there's a increase in, in defense spending, but in the long term that come to pass? Well, uh, first let me say there have been a lot of policy changes and say the Latin American region having experienced crises recently has probably been more alert to that. Uh, so the problems in Latin America, of course, are not simply whether you have a crisis, but uh, I referred to Latin America as a middle income, but of course, there, uh, there's a lot of poverty in Latin America. Uh, it's, you know, in some sense, if you were to compare it to Europe, it's really lower middle income that needs to grow. There are all these pressures for spending and trying to, you know, find ways to deal with social problems. And so it's, it's very challenging of how to do it, even if it's not defense spending, uh, nevertheless, these pressures on spending. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, I don't see any evidence that Latin America, say, is having banking crises or corporate debt crises with these very high interest rates. But it's puzzling that it, that it hasn't happened. I, some of you may know uh, better. But it, it, it seems that if the interest rates stay this high and gro you know, growth doesn't pick up dramatically, uh, it's going to be difficult. Thank you, Professor Rogoff. Well, uh, we, we are now living uh, in this process of uh, deglobalization, but also, I, I mean, for the last decades, we have lived through a period of financial globalization, and with the, with the fragmentation of trade, it also comes the fragmentation of finance. And, the, and, and debt has exploded on the one side, as for all the, main, the, the things you mentioned, but there is also, and you mentioned the demographics of the, of the baby boomers generation, it also implies a change in the risk aversion of the, of the savers and consumers that, that mean safer assets, that mean maybe a way to finance 
the, the U.S. debt, but to to step away from some other assets, and so some of, and, and and this is relevant for the IDB because at some point, with all the financial innovation and all the financial globalization, and access to markets, and and the possibility of doing some of the risking to improve the the access of the Latin American, both the, the public and the private sector. Maybe these possibilities diminish in the future. And, and we, have, we have this. Uh, uh, and also there is another thing that the, uh, with the process of, of trade, uh, uh, of the, the, the globalization, we are going to have a, a big cost in the reshoring or nearshoring of the firms. No? So I would like to know, know your opinion about the about the, I mean, because the prospect for Latin America, you mentioned it, but, the, but there are several elements that might even be like more challenging over time, and, and what can be also the dependence with really entering into the, the, this process of uh, reshoring to, have, let, to get the finance. Let me take the reshoring question first. I mean, that could benefit Latin America for sure. Uh, it, it appears to be benefiting Mexico quite a bit already, and that's that's an area where you know Latin America, um, you know, certainly uh, could be, could benefit. Quite a bit. Also, just not just there's a lot of countries that there's a lot of firms in the fascinating. Why is that not a problem? So there's very much opportunities, but I, I think your point about the social background is very different from the past. Uh, that uh, you know, it's not necessarily helping if there's a substitution away from Latin America. My understanding is uh, a lot of uh, some of the times many or all the times we are present here, there's uh, a lot of demand on the I. Hi, my name is Elias Albagli from the Central Bank of Chile. Um, Great. First, I would like to thank you for a very insightful presentation. Um, I think I share with you the interest rates, and I know you were to what we saw the last day. Uh, or many of the points that you pointed out, the defense spending, that's not for sure. Uh, the green transition, we have to do that. You know, the big investments that all the major tech companies are doing in AI technology. Um, and I know that your presentation was more about the medium-term issues, but I would like to tie tie it to you know the current global outlook, because it seems to me reading the the world economic outlook or other projections that are out there, 
that we're definitely assuming that interest rates are going to go back to where they were. And that's uh, the issue is that uh, most economic agents have actually responded, as we would expect, to an environment of very low rates for a very long time. So the leverage is highest than it has, I think, ever been in the corporate sector in the US, at least. Uh, there's, there's been more risk taking. And the conclusion is, of this is very different if we think that this is, you know, like a hiccup on the way and central banks are going to bring inflation down and we'll be back at, you know, 100 basis points on the 10 year treasury in a couple of years. And then the balance sheet situation will get sort of resolved. But if we don't go back there, I mean, this scenario is kind of uh, not internally consistent. So I don't know if you share that view, or are you concerned about the current situation <laughs> with this in mind? Well, I think everyone's concerned about the current situation. But um, I think as in recent years, the world economic outlook has been remarkably good in its forecast. After the financial crisis, it went through six or seven years, was just always too optimistic. And things were always worse than it said, as you know, you're suggesting might be true. And there have been periods I've thought that, and I've been wrong, and the world outlooks, economic outlook's been right. I mean, I, I'm not trying to pick every forecast. They clearly were too optimistic in January, and I actually wrote about that. But you know, it, it's, it's so hard to know what's going on. I, I definitely think they have too much confidence about real interest rates coming down to where they were. Uh, and probably too little emphasis on the risks of problems in emerging markets like Latin America because the interest rates aren't coming down. It's not clear that the growth is coming up. Or even the, you know, the, they, they talk about uh, the Ukraine war and stuff. I, I think if interest rates stay this high you, or stay, don't come down quickly, you could have a problem anywhere. I think Japan is a place to look at where you know, that's famously, it never happens. But if they ever did have interest rate pressures, and if global real interest rates are rising, that, that has not happened in a long time. There are certainly inflation pressures. The yen has depreciated. We're seeing it in their yield curve. Uh, that's a place you talk about not being ready for having interest rates go up. Let me just give that as an example. And there, uh, another one would be Italy, which has benefited mightily from inflation. It's driven down the value of debt relative to income remarkably. Uh, but going forward, if real interest rates are higher, uh, it may be harder to provide the support that's underpinned Italy. I'm just throwing out examples. But when, it, when interest, it, let me back up a second. The US banking sector is fine because everything, in, it, they've guaranteed everything. That's my read of what policy is. But a lot of banks in the US and around the world have long-term debt. They hold, uh, might not be treasury bills, different kinds. And if they really lost all their deposits today, they'd be insolvent. It's not just liquidity, they're insolvent. And we've reached a situation where the world has changed. There are a lot of, for example, very wealthy depositors who aren't going to accept having a 1% interest rate when the treasury bill rate's 5%. And there are more vulnerabilities. Deposits are not as sticky. So uh, I started to belabor this. But in the old days, oh, the bank was insolvent. It didn't really matter because they just have a really low interest rate for the depositors, have a high interest return. They'll make the money back. Just you know, keep things going for a while. But there, there are many financial institutions that are, I don't want to say acutely vulnerable, but more vulnerable than they were uh, around the world. Teresa, please, go ahead. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much for a very interesting and... Uh, okay. uh, your microphone's not on. <laughs> okay. For a thought-provoking presentation. Um, you have made a very compelling case uh, about the drivers uh, of uh, slow growth uh, in the medium oh, yeah. term, short to medium start. term, uh, worldwide. What's, but what I missed from your presentation is a little bit a sense of what can policymakers, particularly in a region like Latin America, do to make the situation better, to you know, promote some sustainable growth. Can you 
uh, elaborate a little so, bit on that. So, Teresa, thank you for the question. I'm sure you could have given a very good answer to that question, and I will think say what you would have said, uh, which is you need stru education, structural reform, uh, and probably financial support to achieve all of this. But like everywhere in the world, the polarization is just phenomenal. It's very hard to do that. I, I actually have been to Latin America a lot over my career, but not the last few years because of uh, the pandemic. Um, but uh, so, so I'm maybe not quite as in touch as I should be, but in, at least in the, United, in the United States, if you use the word structural reforms, that's neoliberalism, it's terrible, you can't do it. You just, you can't talk about it. You have to, even, I was, I was noticing when I was reading IMF uh, recent, recently, the last few years, and I've commented on this at a conference that they held recently, they never say structural reforms anymore. They have some three paragraph discussion leading to the <laughs> point there are all these inefficiencies and subsidies and if you want to grow faster, you know, you could kind of think about fine tuning here and there. Uh, and, and it's very hard to talk about. So how do you have a conversation in Latin America about what needs to be done when it's not something you know that you can talk about. You want to redistribute income, but particularly in the case of Latin America, where it has not reached the income levels the United States has, and there, the United States has a lot of capacity to redistribute income. It will slow growth, but that's okay, and so there are people who can accept that. That's a very different trade-off to make in other parts of the world, and particularly in uh, Latin American and Caribbean countries, and I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I don't know what, Eric, you're, I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I know the IMF just won't talk about it, and that, I think that's a problem. That, that's a, a very good point, and I really like your long-term view of things, because we talk a, a lot about the, the actual problems, but sometimes we forget about the, the long term. And we are not shy to say we, we should think and implement the structural reform. Uh, and I think we have to insist, and I think it's our responsibility. Do you use those words? And I, I, use, I use personally those words. Um, uh. But the thing is that and, and we are trying to be careful and all the time in terms that, for instance, when we talk about globalization, we said this is one of the most important economic policy in terms of the impact on per capita income. Having said that, we said the new reform should care to the groups that have a negative aim. So that's why we try to move from the slogan of the inclusive and sustainable growth to the, the real stuff. And that's why our recommendations to implement the structural reform should have that component. That's, that's the difference. The problem right now, as you mentioned, is that our societies are really polarized politically. And, it, and it's very difficult to reach agreements, long-term agreements, because every reform is like competition. It's a political competition. So you say black and say white, and we cannot find the, the grace of, of these reforms. And, and that's an important issue. And then in our narrative, is that we have social issues and a lot of social pressures, and that's why we have some protests in some countries with uh, less ammunition on, on, on the fiscal side and with the prospects in terms of economic growth relatively low. So how can we change that? That's, that's the question that we try to answer all, all the time. So thank you for, for, for having that discussion in terms of, of the long term. Now, I don't know if we have more questions on, on this topic or another topic, but probably I, I would like to, to ask a question that we, we have a discussion this morning uh, about the global economic outlook. And I think it's important to have the discussion regarding because of this audience. This audience is mainly composed of representatives of ministers of finance and representatives of central banks. I'm not sure if they are divided in, in two groups here, but but now we perceive certain tension between central banks 
doing their job with higher policy rates, but with an impact on activity, and some governments that are complaining and saying, you know what, it's enough. You raise a lot your policy rates, but probably it's time to, to, to do a, a shift in gears. What do you take about that? Because, and also it's important to say, we care about the autonomy and independence of central banks. So I've certainly been following this for a long time. I think I wrote the first paper on having an independent central bank, and I never dreamed how well it would work in Latin America. I, and when uh, Guillermo Ortiz in Mexico and Arminio Fraga in uh, Brazil was uh, really trying to push for central bank independence, uh, I, I was surprised at how well it's worked. But that said, uh, I mean, things like the pandemic, what's going on in the world, there's just profound problems. And I think a challenge for central banks everywhere is how to bend without breaking. Uh, you know, how do you navigate that so that, you know, frankly, I think one way to look at what happened in the United States with this inflation is uh, we did huge transfers. All the same things done in Latin America. We did huge transfers, government spending, didn't raise taxes, and we had to pay for it. And we accidentally allowed cumulative inflation to probably knock 15% off what our debt to GDP ratio is. And the same things happened in Latin America. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe, you know, if you look at the different options of what was going to happen, uh, we, 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 we have models where, but, but then you have to believe that, you know, it was inexcusable and you're going to rein it in. And how do you do that transition to where you're reining it in? And I think at the moment, the central banks are, I think, talking a pretty good game in uh, Latin America, but the interest rates are high, the problems are still there, and I think you know, uh, the, the battle lies ahead, really, with uh, fiscal policy, because if it stays that way, and in a way, what I was saying, inflation's going to end up higher across the world, is I do think those tensions everywhere, including absolutely the United States and Europe, are going to end up with somewhat higher inflation, central banks bending but not breaking but exactly what that means, we'll see. The, the devil is in, is in the detail, right, as, as usual? Indeed. Okay, so we, with that message, we're gonna end this session. It has been fascinating, uh, full of insight. Uh, so now we have a lot of homework to, to do because of your ideas. And, and thank you very much again. Uh, I know that you have many options in terms of panels and sessions, and you, it was a, a real pleasure to have you here. I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much.